Then Jesus told him a story. Now pay attention. This is the story that I really want you to catch. Jesus told them the story. A man loaned money to two people. 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 to the other. But, but neither of them could re repay him. So he kindly forgave them both. Say both. Everyone say both. Canceling their debts. Who did the man forgive? Who? Which one? 500 or 50? Okay, if your neighbor is not answering, pinch them. He canceled both their debts. Who do you suppose, now this is the question Jesus is asking the Pharisee Simon. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? And Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. Right? Common sense, isn't it? Yes? Yeah. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you did not offer me water to wash the dust off my feet. But she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not greet me with a kiss. But from the time I first came in, this woman has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. If you're wondering about olive oil and head, don't worry, Old Testament stuff, okay? Don't, don't be worried about that. Don't go buy olive oil and try to put it on your hair. You will not look good, uh, even if you have hair. But... Um, then he said, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. And Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men sitting at the table said among themselves, these are all the other Pharisees who were at the table. There were more Pharisees invited to the dinner and they were, were chatting among themselves. They said, who is this man that goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, not to the Pharisees, but to the woman, your faith has saved you. Say saved you. Say that again, saved you. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Go in peace. Week three of the sermon series, Choose, and I want to talk to you about something important, but I need your help. All right? Are you willing to help your pastor? Yes. Five people. What about the rest? You hate me. Okay. Your help will be responding, okay? Respond. Uh, uh, let me know if it makes sense. Let me know if it does not make sense. Only please don't throw a shoe at me, okay, if you're pissed off with me, all right? Will you do that? Yeah, yeah. can this be a, a, in a live crowd? Will you help me out? Okay, much better. I like to preach uh, to people who, who like smile or, or, or say something good. Otherwise, I don't know if this is making sense or you're hating me in your mind. You're like, uh, I don't know because your faces look like a bad word. Uh, but anyways. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But this is week three. I'll try to make this as, as, uh, as easy as possible. Week three of the sermon series, Choose, and um, today I want to start the sermon by asking you a question, okay? Question time. Uh, but you got to be honest with yourself. Don't be Christian here, okay? Be real, all right? Can we be real? Are you going to be honest? Okay, if you're going to be honest, I'll ask you this question. Ready? Think about, think about five things, all right? Five things that have frustrated you in this past week. Okay, just, just five things. But think about them, okay? Don't, don't, don't shout them out loud, all right? Because uh, you might be sitting next to your wife and you might say, my mother-in-law frustrated me this last week. And we don't want to cause any marital problems, uh, especially I don't want to, because I'll have to counsel you back, right? Uh, so, uh, five things. Five things that have frustrated you in this last week. Five things that you have complained about in this past week. Only five things. It's easy, right? Right? Most of you guys have got five things. Yeah? It's easy because things frustrate us all the time. 
especially today, especially in 2019, especially in India, right? Especially in Goa, because there's so many things that frustrate us on a regular basis. The, the traffic frustrates us, you know, the, the, the internet frustrates us, right? We had a terrible week with the internet. The broadband frustrates us. Our, the internet on your phone, it shows 4G, but it's not 4G, right? You know they're lying, but still they just put that 4G and I'm like, uh, you are lying to my face, right? It's frustrating. Power cuts frustrate us, right? Right? Anyone agrees with that? Yeah, uh, people frustrate us all the time. You go home, your, your kids frustrate you, your family frustrates you, sometimes your spouse frustrates you, the family of your spouse for sure frustrates you, right? That's definite, that's universal. Family of the spouse has to frustrate, that's, a, you know, that's understood, right? right? Some of you are agreeing, some of you are scared to agree, but we get frustrated, there are things that frustrate us all the time. You go home, you look yourself in the mirror, your weight frustrates you, your hair frustrates you, pimple frustrates you, right? Everything frustrates us today. It's easy to be frustrated today. You agree? Yeah. If you agree, let me ask you another question now, all right? Another question, again. Just like you thought about five things that frustrated you last week, think about five things that you were grateful for in the past week. I'm not saying think about them now. I'm saying think about the times last week that you were grateful for. How many times were you grateful for things last week? Now that is hard, isn't it? Isn't that harder? Isn't that harder? Don't you agree with me? If you're really honest with yourself, if you really think about it, you will agree that, that, that being frustrated is far more easy than being grateful, right? Being frustrated is like something that comes naturally to us. Right? But, but being grateful requires an effort. Being grateful requires intentionality. Right? Anyone agrees with me? Yeah. And, and let, me, let me tell you this, okay? It's not just today. It's not just today's generation, today's world, 2019. Because uh, most of us say, oh my God, 2019, what has the world come to? Everything is so frustrating, right? It's not just today. People have been complaining all throughout history. Every generation, I don't think there's a single generation in, uh, in history that had not been frustrated. People always complained. Right? Today it seems like the whole world is frustrated because you have internet. You have social media. It's so easy today to express your frustration on your phone and the whole world knows. So you open your phone and you're like, oh my God, people even in, in like uh, Norway are frustrated. Like, you know, how, what has happened? The whole world. No, no, no. People have always been frustrated. There has, this has been a human problem. Your, the previous generation, when they did not have internet, when, when I was there, like I grew up in that generation, when we did not have internet, okay? When we did not have social me media, during that time, you know how we would uh, express our frustration? We would go to the, to the grocery store and we would tell the guy every morning and every evening, so much corruption, so bad. My teacher is bad. My father is bad, right? That's what we used to do. Yeah, the barber, the chaiwala, all these people, they were the poor guys. They were the targets. Right? They're happy now. They're happier people. You remember Chandu? Remember Chandu? Chandu was this grocery store guy that uh, when, when I was growing up, when I was a teenager, right? And, and I always noticed this about Chandu. Chandu used to look very sick. Like Chandu, he looked very old. Like Chandu looked like he was 60 years old, but actually Chandu back then was only 30 years old. But, but, and I thought he had a, a sickness, he had some a disease or something. You know how teenagers think, right? Anytime they see a problem, they're like, you know, he got that disease. I think, I think he, he's... 
I would think Chandu has that, but poor guy, Chandu used to look old because everybody used to come to his shop and complain. Not about Chandu, but about their problems. To Chandu, as if Chandu could do anything, right? They used to come for a, buy a cigarette, take a puff of smoke and say, my mother-in-law is back. And she's, uh, you know, uh, aren't all mother-in-laws that? Like, I hate my mother-in-law. Even I'm sure your mother-in-law. And Chandu's like, I'm not never getting married. Right? Someone else will come puff their smoke and say, my son failed again. The kids are terrible. This new generation, rubbish. My son is useless. Right? It was not my father, by the way. He, he never smoked. Well, I didn't check. I never saw him at Chandu shop. I wouldn't know. But, Dad, if you're watching, I'm sorry. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Even kids used to complain. Even kids. When I was growing up, kids used to complain. I used to see kids going to Chandu shop, buying a cigarette. Because kids smoke like that, right? Have you seen a kid smoke? They never, like, puff straight. They're like, because they want the whole world to see, I'm smoking. Right? And then they... They'll do those rings, right? <laughs> That's how kids smoke. And kids would like, my girlfriend left me. <laughs> See, I made a heart. But now it's broken. That's because my heart is broken. But everyone complain. Every generation complain. Humans always complain. Your parents complain, your grandparents complain, your great-great-grandparents complain, all the way to the Bible even, the biblical times, the Old Testament. Open the Old Testament, you'll read about a complaining generation. People complained when they were uh, slaves in Egypt, they complained after they were set free from slavery. They complained in the wilderness, they complained in the promised land. They complained because they did not have a king, they complained because they had a king. Human beings have always complained. You and I, we are an ungrateful being. We really are. That's our nature. We are ungrateful by nature. And being grateful requires effort. Being grateful requires intentionality. Being grateful requires sermons like this one. Being grateful requires choosing. You need to choose to be grateful. And that's my sermon title today. Choose to be grateful. Gratitude is a choice. Have you ever heard the phrase, the attitude of gratitude? More than gratitude being an attitude, gratitude is a choice. It's a choice that you need to make. Every single day of your life, it's a choice that you have in everything that you do. You can choose to be grateful. You can choose to be grateful. It's in your hand. It's your choice. You can just choose to be grateful in everything that you do every day of your life. Choose to be grateful. Turn to your neighbor and say that to them. Choose to be grateful. Turn to the other neighbor. Don't leave them alone. Don't leave them frustrated. Long distance neighbors. Choose to be grateful. You'll have every reason in your life. You'll have every reason to be, to be frustrated. You'll have a good reason to be frustrated every single day. Right? Just like this woman that we read about, right? In the, in the story, we read about this woman. I think her name was Mary because uh, the other gospels give her name to us. Her name was Mary, and Mary had every reason to be frustrated. She had good reasons to be frustrated. The, the, the Bible calls her an immoral woman. Bible scholars believe that she was a prostitute. She was a prostitute. Mary, this, this, this lady in the, in, the, in the story that we just read, she was a prostitute. Mary was in the line of work where she had to sell her body every day to unknown men. And sometimes even worse, to known men. 
Tell me about a job that's more frustrating than that one. That's a frustrating job. Mary had every reason to be frustrated. What's, what's more frustrating than that is that Mary had to go to the home of a Pharisee. A, 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 a sinful woman, a, a woman, a prostitute who has absolutely no respect in society, going to the home of someone who is highly respected in society. That's frustrating, right? Uh, and, and to make matters worse for Mary, Pharisees were, were known to judge people. She was going to the home of, of someone who is known to judge people, is known for that. That's his job. Pharisees were, were people who would judge everyone, they would, would call them sinners, who would call out their sins. That was their job. They did this for a living. Every single day, they would point out and call out your sins. Say why you are bad or what you are wearing is bad. Just to give you modern day perspective, if, if I had to invite a Pharisee here at Limitless Church today for service, this Pharisee would be going around the room looking at everyone like that and, and looking at you and saying, that skirt It's too short. Like you're showing legs in church? What is your intention in showing your legs? You're a sinner. Right? Tattoo? Tattoos are evil. Piercings are demonic. Black is the color, oh my God, red also, the color of the devil. Ah, right, right. Navel, you're showing your navel in church. Oh my God, navel, that's, that's seductive, right? Have you ever met people like that? I meet people like that all the time. And, and what, what really cracks me up completely is people who, who think navel, showing your navel is seductive. Like, I, that is what I, I cannot handle. Like, how can a navel be a seductive thing? That's the most unseductive part. It's like a nose. It's like a ear. It's just the navel, right? I mean, and, we, and this is Goa. In, in Konkani, we call it Bombli. Isn't it? How can, how can Bombly be seductive? Like, there's no way a word called Bombly can be seductive. But, but according to a Pharisee, Bombly is seductive. If you're showing your Bombly in church, you are seducing people. That is who a Pharisee is. And those were people who were in that house that day. Right? Can you imagine the people Mary had to face getting into that house? Have you ever thought about the story through the eyes of Mary? Can you imagine the scene that Mary had to face getting into that house? Mary had to face all these men, all these Pharisees looking at her with judgment in their eyes, with, with, with disgust on their faces, judging her for the way she was dressed. Judging her for who she was. Judging her for what she did. Every step that she took, they were judging her as she walked into that. Can you imagine how frustrating it would have been for Mary? Probably more frustrating than the people that you face. Probably more frustrating than the situations that you face in your daily life. Probably more frustrating than your mother-in-law. Than your boss. Then your girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, hoping that you don't get frustrated with your current girlfriend. In that moment, in that day, Mary had, Mary had a choice to make. She had a choice to make to either be frustrated with her haters or be grateful. Not to her haters, but to Jesus. In that moment, on that day, walking into that house... Showing her navel or whatever, piercings and all of that. As a prostitute, walking into that house, into the house of a highly respected man who was known to judge people and his friends, Mary had a choice. She had a choice to choose one of two things, frustration or gratitude. And she could only choose one, frustration or gratitude. 
either be frustrated by the Pharisees or be grateful to Jesus. Either be frustrated by her haters or be grateful to her Savior. That was the choice that Mary had. And Mary chose to be grateful. She ignored all her haters and her focus and her, her gaze was on Jesus. And she chose in that moment to be grateful to my Savior. Grateful to Jesus. She chose to be grateful. What do you choose in moments like those? In, in, when you face frustrating people, when you face frustrating situations, what do you choose? You choose to be frustrated or do you choose to be grateful? Some of us don't even know it's a choice, right? Some of us don't even know, is that a choice? Because some of us just get frustrated, isn't it? If I, if I come to you at any time when you're looking frustrated, if I, if I come to you and I ask you, why are you so frustrated? You are going to point your finger to, to your haters, point your finger to all those people, all those situations, and you're going to say to me, it's because of them. They are frustrating me. My kids are frustrating me. My parents are frustrating me. My ex is frustrating me. My mother-in-law is frustrating me. But the reality is, they are not frustrating you. You have chosen to be frustrated by them. Because being frustrated is a choice. It's a choice. But here's the good news. You have another choice. You have a choice to be grateful. In every moment that you are faced with potential situations that will frustrate you, in every moment of frustration, you have a choice to either choose to be frustrated or choose to be grateful. Gratefulness will always be a choice when you're faced with frustration. What will you choose? What will you choose? Mary chose to be grateful to Jesus. I want to tell you how big this choice is because I want to dig this deep. I want to make sure you get this. This is the part I want you to catch. Imagine now, think about it. If Mary, in that moment when she walked into the house, faced by all these people who were judging her, all these Pharisees, if Mary had to choose to be frustrated instead of choosing to be grateful, if Mary would choose frustration over gratitude, Mary would have missed her salvation. In that moment, in that day, if she had to look at all these faces and chosen to be frustrated by them, like you choose to be frustrated by people who judge you, who irritate you all the time. Oh my God, these people are here again. They're going to talk about my navel. Oh my God, they're going to talk about my tattoo. Why are they always following me? Like, well, what's happening? If Mary had to choose to be frustrated by her haters, she would have missed her salvation. She would have missed the forgiveness of her sins. Every, every time, I'm going to say something that might frustrate you. Every time that you choose to be frustrated, you have missed an opportunity of an encounter with Jesus. Every time, you give in to frustration. You're missing something that Jesus wants to do in your life. I asked you about five things, right? I asked you to think about five things that have frustrated you last week. And most of you guys had at least five things, right? It was easy. Which tells me, in the last one week, 
There were at least five times that Jesus wanted to do something in your life and you missed it. Maybe a missed miracle. Maybe a missed breakthrough. Maybe a missed work in your heart. At least five times, you have missed an encounter with Jesus. That is how big this choice is. This is how big it is. Because look, the devil knows. The devil knows that Jesus is about to do something incredible in your life. And he, he will try his best to distract you. He'll try his best to defeat you, to stop you. But if he cannot stop you, if he cannot defeat you, he will frustrate you. And if you get frustrated, you'll miss your miracle. Mary went from becoming, from being a prostitute, from being a prostitute, Mary went to become the most central figure in one of the most important and most famous stories in the Bible. With this one choice. One choice of being grateful to Jesus. Not distracted by all these people, all these opportunities that, that come your way. She chose to focus and she said, you know what? I don't care. I'll try to find Jesus among these faces and I'm going to go and show my gratitude to Jesus. This is how big this choice really is. Amen? Amen. Isn't this a big choice? Anyone, anyone grateful for Jesus now? Yes. You know why we... Why we are not very grateful people? Let me, let me disclose that to you, okay? Because it's difficult, right? It's difficult to choose this uh, choice, being grateful. It is difficult. When you're faced with, with sucky situations, when you're faced with all these irritating people in your life, it's very difficult to choose this. And we naturally get frustrated. But let me tell you why we usually get frustrated so easily. You want to know why? I'm waiting for uh, one person said why. Everyone is like, no, no, I, leave me alone. I love being frustrated. Like, this is who I am. I'm a frustrated person. And I love that. I love, I'm Mr. F. Like, I, I like to F people. And I, I, I like to be F by people, right? Frustrated, I mean, by people. What are you guys laughing at? Isaac, what are you laughing at? What are you learning in school? Uh, just, just kidding. Frustration. Let me tell you why. Okay, let me tell you why. Jesus, uh, Jesus told a story, a parable in this story that we read. He, 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 he talked about a parable. And that is one of the most important teachings of Jesus Christ, which, which we've missed or we misunderstood. But I, I want to explain, I want to unwrap that. This is the meat of the sermon. Uh, it's, it's in, um, I'm just going to read those two verses. It's a very short parable. Verse 41 to 42. Here it is. And Jesus told him the story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both. Does it say that? Yes? He forgave both of them? Yeah. He forgave them both. Canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? And Simon answered, I suppose the one whom he has canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said, that is right. And then he goes on to, to, to compare what Simon did not do versus what Mary did, right? And towards the end, verse 47, he says, I tell you this, her sins, and there are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love, but a person who has forgiven little only shows little love. When you read this story, when you read this, this, this parable of Jesus, most of us think, and maybe this is something that you've learned in your Sunday school, right? Maybe this is something that has been taught to you, uh, you know, Sunday school teachers. But uh, most of us think that Jesus is comparing two people, Simon and Mary. Most of us think that Jesus is saying that Simon uh, had committed fewer sins, and Mary had committed many sins, 
right? And because Simon committed fewer sins, he was forgiven little. And because Mary had committed more sins, she was forgiven more. And because Simon was forgiven little, he only loves Jesus little. He only is grateful for little. But Mary, because she was forgiven a lot, she is grateful a lot. Right? This is what we think Jesus is saying. We think Jesus is comparing the quantity of their sins. And that's the problem. That is the problem. That is why we don't understand gratitude. That's why we are frustrated. Jesus never compares quantity of sins. He doesn't compare how many sins you have committed versus how many sins she has committed. Jesus never compares the quantity of sin. Sin is sin. To Jesus, sin is sin. No matter if you've sinned one sin in your whole life or you've sinned a million sins in your whole life. Sin is sin. Jesus does not compare the quantity of your sin. Jesus compares the awareness of your sin. Because the more you are aware of your sin, the more you will be aware of his forgiveness. It's never about how good you are compared to another person. It's about how bad you are compared to the goodness of God. It's always about how bad you are compared to the mercy of God, compared to the forgiveness of God, compared to the grace of God. Never compare yourself with another person. The Bible says for everyone... Everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standards. The problem is we think it's our standard. It is the pastor's standard, right? So you, you look at your pastor and you say, oh, he, he does not drink alcohol. So uh, I uh, drink only one glass a week uh, uh, so I, I'm, cl I'm, I'm close I'm, I'm good uh, but that guy he's drunk every day right so compared to that guy I'm good right I'm, I'm gooder so so we that is how we think we compare ourselves with people around us God compares us with Jesus compared to Jesus we all sinners we're all the same level, including me. I, I'm, I'm there. You have a sinner pastor. I'm sorry, but that's what you got. We're all the same. We are in the same boat. We're all miserable human beings compared to the level of Jesus Christ. Unless you understand that, you won't understand gratitude. We skip the part and we say we are sinners saved by grace, right? And we say it so fast that we skip the word sinners. We've become a generation that just goes, we are, we are saved by grace. We are saved by grace. The sinner word does not come out. It is important. Unless you understand that, you won't understand gratitude. You will be a frustrated being. If you compare yourself with other human beings, you'll always be fr frustrated. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Because you think that you deserve something. You know what frustration is? Really? Frustration is, is when you thought you deserve something and you didn't get it. Right? If you're a person who thinks it's because of your good things that makes you a gooder, or loved by God, or a better person, because of your good things that you do, you deserve something from God, you will go to God and you say, God, I deserve a, a better day. I deserve a better life. I deserve a better job. I deserve a better husband, a better wife, a better girlfriend, a better boyfriend. I deserve better than this. And because you're not giving me what I deserve, I am now frustrated. 
because I deserve better. That is why we get frustrated. Because we compare ourselves to others. And if we find that we are better than another group, then we suddenly believe in our minds that now we deserve. And when you don't get what you think you deserve, you get frustrated. You get frustrated. Let me, let me, let me tell you something that will, if you take this seriously, you'll, you'll at least not choose to be frustrated. If you think about this every day, you won't be a frustrated person. And this is not something that pastors usually say from the pulpit. But I'll still take a risk and say this. Can I, can I be a risky pastor? You do not deserve anything. You don't deserve anything from God. Nothing at all. Not even your life. You don't even deserve to be born. You don't. Because you haven't done anything to be born, right? You have not done anything to create yourself. You don't deserve to be born. You just one day opened your eyes and you realize, oh my God, what is this? This is life. What are these cute people? I just say what they tell me to say. And then you, you jumped into life. You did not even deserve to be born. Your life is a gift from God. And the only fair response of human beings to this gift called life and to this God who is amazing, who created us, the only thing that is fair that you say to him is gratitude. Is thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. The only fair thing to do really is to be grateful. That's the only fair thing that human beings can respond to God. Anyone grateful for the life that you have? Anyone grateful that you are alive today, that you are one of those uh, sperms, is it sperms that made it, right? You are one of those, those beings that were created of a million that were not. You have a gift called life. And the only response to the creator of your life, to the giver of your life, is gratefulness. The reason why I keep on uh, repeating every sermon, I, every sermon that, that I preach, I, I always uh, mention the, the work of Jesus on the cross, right? The, the, the gospel message, Jesus died for our sins. The reason why I do that is not because I need more content in my sermons. My sermons are long anyways, right? My, 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 my team, they cut my sermons. They try to edit them. They tell me every week, it's too long. Right? Some of you guys are also feeling it's too long, right? You feel my sermon should be shorter? No. Yeah, no. All you guys, other people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some are. How long do you watch Netflix? <laughs> A week, right? But the reason why I say this every week about Jesus Christ, the salvation message, is because we human beings, we need reminders. Every day, in fact. I try to do it once a week. We need to remind ourselves that we don't deserve anything. So let me remind you again, all right? And I'll, and I'll do this in closing. I'll close with this. So let me give you this reminder that, that you need every week. In fact, every day of your life. You ready? You ready? We suck. Yeah, that's a reminder. We suck. at this thing called life. We are incapable of living life. We're so bad in everything that we do. Either we pretend to be good and we look like hypocrites or we're just bad and we accept it and we love being bad. It's either one of those two things. We are bad people. The human race is bad. And the only thing that we really deserve as human beings 
is death. The whole human race was walking towards hell. Walking towards eternal destruction. We had no hope. We could not save ourselves. Not even one person could save themselves. That's why God decided to do that himself. So God sent his son, which is God himself, now in human form, God came down, took your, your body, like our flesh and blood, and he became human, and he lived a human life. And he lived a sinless life, not one sin. He lived a perfect life, the life that you should have been living. The life that you need to be living if you want to make it till eternity. He lived your life. He lived in your place. Because you could not do it, he did it for you. And then he died for you and then he died in your place he went to the cross and he he took all your punishment for your sins he took all the sins upon himself and he died on that cross but he died in your place and because he died in your place now you can live in his place Because Jesus died in your place, took your punishments, you get to live in His place. Because of the death of Jesus on that cross, you have eternal life. You have limitless life. Do you realize you will never stop existing? Because of Jesus, you will never stop existing. Yes, you will stop existing in this human body on this earth. But your existence will never end. You are limitless. You are limitless. You are eternal because of Jesus Christ and His death on the cross. So what's your response to Jesus? Is your response Frustration or your, is your response gratitude? What do you choose in response to that? Every day of your life, do you choose to be frustrated or do you choose to be grateful? What do you choose? If you choose to be grateful, if you choose gratitude, your gratitude has to look like something. Right? If you choose to be grateful, gratefulness has to look like something. Gratitude is not gratitude if it does not look like something. Mary is not a hero. Mary's story is not in the Bible just because she felt grateful in her heart. She did not write a song, thank you Lord. No, she, that was not. It's not because she felt gratefulness in her heart. The story is special. It's in the book called the Bible because Mary showed her gratitude. Gratitude is not gratitude if it doesn't look like something. Mary's gratitude was seen. And it was seen in the form of her pouring her most precious possession, her most prized possession, which was a perfume, on the feet of Jesus. Something that was so valuable, the, the, the price of that perfume was one year's worth of her salary. It's a lot of money, right? It's a lot of money. And she poured it all. She exhausted it on the feet of Jesus. She did not save anything on the side. She completely gave it to Jesus. And we think, 
that the story is special because the perfume was expensive, right? We think, oh my God, it was such an expensive uh, gift that Mary gave. So now give in your offering boxes, right? We use that for offerings a lot. That's the trick that we play, right? But, but, but the story is not special because the perfume was expensive. The story is special because the perfume was important to her, was important to her livelihood, was important to her job, to her existence, to her identity. Her perfume was something that attracted her clients to her as a prostitute. Her perfume was something that, that made her clients pick her in the crowd of other prostitutes. Her perfume was something that would make her stand out in front of other prostitutes. Perfume is something that prostitutes um, use for, for more clients, for more business. Her perfume was something that, that got her more business, that, that, that uh, got her more clients, that sustained her. And she poured everything on the feet of Jesus, completely. Her perfume was an X factor. And she poured her X factor on the feet of Jesus, completely. What do you think happened to a business as a prostitute after that? What do you think happened to her career as a prostitute after she poured her X Factor, her, her special flavor on the feet of Jesus? What do you think happened? What happened to her career as a prostitute after that? Her career was finished, right? Mary was not a prostitute anymore. In a, in a moment of gratitude, Mary went from being a prostitute to a hero of sermons like these preached all over the world in different churches all throughout history in a moment of gratefulness, in a moment of gratitude. What moral policing could not do, what, what moral behavior correction could not do, what self-help books could not do, what counseling could not do, what prayers could not do, what touching people and falling down could not do gratitude did it in a moment of gratitude Mary was set free from the chains of prostitution for all eternity that is the power of gratitude that is mercy that is mercy for you Gratitude gets you mercy, but gratitude also gets you grace because this was grace. This was the picture of grace. Mary, who was this disgusted being who religious leaders would look down upon, frown upon, be disgusted at, judge. She went on to become the most spoken about, a hero of sermons that pastors would, would preach about. We use Mary to tell you what gratitude is, what mercy is, what grace is. Mary became a hero. That is grace. That is how amazing Jesus is. But it all happened in a moment, in an action, in an expression of gratefulness. Mary's gratitude look like pouring perfume on the feet of Jesus. What does your gratitude look like? If you say you're grateful to Jesus today, what does your gratefulness look like? Because gratefulness is not gratefulness if it does not look like something. What does your gratefulness look like? Let me invite you this Christmas season. And it's going to be Christmas soon, right? That, yeah, see, my sermon did not put a smile on your face. Christmas did. Something about Christmas. I love Christmas as well. But this Christmas season, let me invite you to a, a lifestyle of gratitude. Not just an attitude. Not just one uh, choice. But a lifestyle of choosing to be grateful. Let me invite you to that lifestyle. Let me invite you to ask this question to yourself every day. What does my gratitude look like? 
this Christmas season? What is that one thing that I know I should be pouring at the feet of Jesus? What is that one thing, just like Mary had a perfume which was sustaining her, which was her identity, which was her, 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 her standout thing, her X factor. What is that one thing that's keeping me chained to this terrible life? What is that one thing that I need to pour at the feet of Jesus? What does my gratefulness look like? Let me invite you this Christmas. Ask yourself this question. It's the best time of the year. People are preaching about Thanksgiving, right? Thanksgiving is coming in, a, in, in I think, this weekend or, or next week. This is a good time to be grateful. But gratefulness is not just a song or a feeling. Gratefulness is action. What does your gratefulness look like? Ask yourself this question. You don't have to show me, you show Jesus. You show Jesus. Don't wait till Christmas, okay? Don't wait for Christmas Day. Don't wait for New Year's Day and say it's my New Year's resolution. That never works, all right? New Year's resolutions don't work. I preach this sermon today. The word of the Lord came to you today. Your response to God is today. You choose to be grateful today. Today. Anyone grateful today? All the grateful people in the room said.